वेलकम वेलकम वन एंड ऑल आर वी या ओके फैंटास्टिक माय नेम इज अश्विन अग्रवाल and i'm from dr agarwal i hospital india chennai i'm very excited today to bring to you this engaging series of education which we are calling it the ed vision It means basically education on vision we're educating people on i care because we truly believe that just by giving the right education to people that we will be able to help them make the best decision for them and their families along with this there exists a huge number of myths and beliefs deep deeply rooted in our history and our culture that prevent us from reaching out to doctors like us the schedule of the doctor and the ties of the system really makes it probably unapproachable at times this is why ed vision was created now let me tell you also covid has been the single most contributing factor across the world for a global digital transformation and this has also pushed us doctors to engage with you all in a way that was never possible before or we wouldn't have thought of it either so here's to future of engagement ed vision what is ed vision can we have the presentation please it's an ongoing series no can we go back it's an ongoing series to educate everybody about i care in the comfort of their homes next it's we try to engage with who wants to know about i health and how they want to take care of their families i health it's a platform for everybody to get an opportunity to interact with senior i care practitioners across the world directly over a technology platform next what's the objective now we all know that so many confusing informations that we see upon google or friends and family which come and tell us so we want to clear the air about these myths and beliefs that are there uh along with that we want to reassure those with the sound medical inputs that are possible a simple advice on i care and information about something new that's also coming in this is huge which can actually make a big big inroad in education of patients next these are the calendar of events that have we've planned out for the next coming few months uh we, we wish that this is a lot in line with what are the real problems on the ground that you as as people face and we as doctors encounter next a uh, broadcast we will be broadcasting live on our facebook and our youtube channels having said that we also have our instagram page where we will follow so you can know about updates when we are coming up with our next and what the real new item is you can also send us Uh, questions on that page. Uh, we're happy to have that answer. We will be personally involved in that uh, replies. Next, what's the topic today? We we'll try to break some myth on laser surgery to get rid of glasses. That's the topic today, and how to be engaged. Before we move on to introductions, and I'm, I'm eager to actually introduce our guest uh, today. but before we move on i wanted to give you the engagement possibilities here next 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 okay uh you're all watching this on probably three platforms okay zoom for very very restricted amount but facebook and youtube channels are open for every single person so here's what you got to do if you have a question while the event is going on or prior or before or after the uh, presentation stops please put that question into the chat box and we'll collect this information we will ensure that this information comes out to us and we'll have that answer directly right here right now there's no uh, no back channels but there are sometimes can we have the next one sometimes what happens is you might we might not be able to cover all the questions so 
definitely please reach out to us on any of these platforms. We're happy to have that question answered. Uh, we actually, all questions want to be answered and no question is silly. Uh, believe me, I know I've asked many silly questions myself. Uh, have, no, can we stop? Thank you. Um, in terms of introduction, I mean, I want to introduce Dr. Susan Jacob, but first I want to introduce our own Chennai girl. Uh, she's Nama Chennai, as we call it. But uh, very important to understand, she is from our, she's in our South Indian movie industry for the past 15 years. She started off uh, anchoring uh, a kids TV channel, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm correct. And if I'm not, you can correct me, Regina. But uh, she has done more than 29 films in Tamil, Telugu, Kannada and Hindi. Uh, now she's a vegetarian because she reads after reading an article, am I right, uh, on animal cruelty? I was a vegetarian for seven years. Okay, lovely. Not, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. But uh, welcome, Regina. Thank you so much for doing this. And we are definitely going to engage with you a lot more during this event. Thank Any you. Any words that you want, to, you want to share something, you can please go ahead and introduce. Uh, firstly, thank you for having me over today to talk about uh, refractive eye surgery, something that uh, not too many people are yet aware of. Um, and having been someone who's done it, it uh, it's only, I feel like it's only my responsibility to come here today and, you know, share all of this with everyone. My experience, whatever little bit that I can share from a layman's perspective, I think that would be really great because I had um, a lot of questions as well before I got to do it. And Dr. Susan was the person who did uh, the surgery for me. And it's really nice to be back here today. And I think my uh, relationship with Dr. Agarwal's goes uh, like you know back to a few years um, I have uh, inaugurated a few of the hospitals in and around uh, Telangana and uh, Chennai and all of that so it's um, it's really nice to be here today to share my views on my experience with everybody. Thank you so much that's so kind of you thank you. Uh, moving on to Dr. Susan I mean it's not easy to introduce somebody uh, with the kind of accolades, which probably the accolades itself will go half an hour if I keep talking about her. <laughs> um, but, but let me say she's an absolutely terrific cornea, refractive cataract surgeon who deals with a lot of attention to innovation. She deals with a lot of attention to uh, perfection. And, uh, and, and that's, that's something that, you know, everybody cherishes in her. And she brings that very, very, with, with a lot of ease, I would say. Uh, so to, to say that, I think we couldn't have had a better uh, inaugural speaker for Envision who actually has imparted knowledge across the world, not just in India. So thank you, Susan, for doing this and uh, welcome. Ashwin, thanks a lot for inviting me here. We would love to say you to say a few words as well as then present your presentation, please. All right. Uh, well, um, Thanks a lot uh, for inviting me here. I think this is going to be a, a great series of programs, uh, which is very different in that it's going to be educating uh, the patients and uh, the general public about their uh, you know problems that they have in eye surgery and things like that. And I think we are lucky to start off with one of the topics that's very close to my heart, that is refractive surgery and, uh, and its importance, its significance, how it changes your life and things like that. And uh, we are also lucky in another sense that we have Regina here with us uh, to share her experience on this uh, uh, on this topic and how she underwent it and uh, things like that. So uh, without much more ado, I think uh, I will just share my presentation, uh, which is basically going to be uh, just a bit about uh, refractive surgery in general. Before... Uh before we start, uh, can we have all the audience just have your fingers ready. If you have a question, don't hesitate. Put it in that comment box. We will have that answered as soon as the presentation, uh, all both the presentations get over. So please go ahead and feed in those questions. Keep them coming. We want all of your questions answered. All right. <clears throat> Fine. Um, I am not able to see my screen. Yeah, me too. One second. 
Uh, I'm sorry about that. No problem. Regina, if we may ask, uh, how long were you wearing glasses before? Uh, I, um, I started when I was about uh, 13. Around okay. okay, yeah, that's usually the okay. yeah. Thank you. Susan, all yours. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, so the talk is going to be uh, not a very detailed talk, but just some information on uh, the types of refractive surgeries that are available. Uh, I uh, am heading the Dr. Agarwal's Refractive and Cornea Foundation uh, in uh, Dr. Agarwal's Eye Hospital, Chennai. But of course, we have a large uh, group of hospitals, about 95 of them across the world. Now, uh, coming to uh, why, uh, what we need to understand first uh, when we talk about refractive surgery is that the eye is very similar to a camera. So if you look at the eye, uh, what the camera does is focus the rays onto the film of the camera or onto the digital screen. And what the eye does is something very similar, which is basically focus the eye, the actual light rays that come onto the retina. So in that sense, what you need to do is to be in focus. And that's what happens to the majority of population. But some people are not in focus. And that's when you have these refractive errors or uh, ha you have to wear glass power. And these refractive errors can be classified into a variety of uh, different types. I'm sure those of you who wear glasses have heard these terms at some point of time in your lives. Uh, you could be myopic, which means that you have short-sightedness. You could be hyperopic, which means you have long-sightedness. Uh, you could have astigmatism, which is basically that there's no clear point focus at all. And then uh, there's something that everyone undergoes around the age of 40 years when you become press biopic and you start to find reading a little difficult. There's also a special type of refractive error which is called aberopia and uh, this uh, was described here at Dr. Agarwal's eye hospital and that is to do with aberrations of the eye and uh, that's more to do with diseased eyes and we can possibly deal with that later maybe in the Q&A session. So now, what are the various modes of correction of refractive error? You, of course, have what is very commonly used, which are glasses and contact lenses. And then you have the surgical mode, which is uh, which could be of so many different types, you know, and we'll come to that. Uh, well, what are the disadvantages of glasses? I mean, lots of people do wear glasses. I wear glasses. But then you do have some problems, uh, which include... Uh, you know, achieving good correction, higher power, especially and thicker glasses. When you have thicker glasses, you have that, uh, especially in minus powers, the minification of images. Everything seems small to you when you see it as uh, compared to, I'm sure those of you who compared who worn contact lenses and glasses, you'll find that you're much happier with contact lenses than with glasses, especially when you have those higher powers. Uh, and that's because of the, uh, the actual effect of the lens of the glass that's having on your vision. You also can have compromised peripheral vision due to frames and lenses. You could have blind spots uh, you, in, your, in your vision. Uh, you can have difficulty in sports and in maintaining an active lifestyle. Uh, sweat, temperature changes, these are things that all everybody who's wear the uh, worn glasses have experienced at some point of time, reflections, glare, uh, and of course the, the headache of having to change your glasses frequently because of uh, uh, scratches and things like that, damage to the glasses basically. Contact lenses are a very good alternative, but they can sometimes lead to problems. Uh, you need to have a very good fitting done at, a, done at an established uh, place with a good optometrist or an ophthalmologist. You should not have more than eight hours of use, which is a major limiting factor as far as I see, because after eight hours, you're dependent on your glasses. Uh, and that can have, uh, you know, cosmetic uh, repercussions for many people as well. So care, 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 that's utmost uh, with contact lenses. You have to be very careful. Uh, they can cause dry eyes, allergic uh, allergies in the eye, chronic redness. Uh, they are associated with the risk of infection. So you, you do need to be very careful in handling them and cleaning them and storing them. All of this is very important. Uh, you need to be careful not to contaminate your solution, your case, your contact lens. Uh, and the long term, it can lead to damage to the surface of the eye, cornea, or lids, and can even cause changes in the shape of the eye. So these are some of the reasons uh, why uh, I uh, really like this procedure. Uh, it's very close to my heart, as I said. These are the this is what we call as a laser refractive procedure. It's uh, basically a simple uh, procedure. Uh, it's a surgery, of course, uh, but it's uh, it's a very simple come in and step out, step in into the uh, laser suite and go out kind of procedure. Uh, you know, your questions, of course, at this stage would be, am I an ideal candidate? Well, the ideal candidate is someone who's above 18 years, who has a stable refractive error. Sometimes we, we would say it as 21 years. But the, the important thing is that you need to have a stable refractive error. Men and women, everyone's, of course, uh, of course, in an ideal candidate. You need to be motivated for this, of course, and you should be in an overall 
good uh, health. There are a lot of tests that are done, uh, a lot of tests, and I won't go into detail in this. Basically, you examine every part of the eye to make sure that you are a fit candidate for uh, this kind of surgery. So there's a detailed evaluation of your corneal shape, your uh, surface of the eye, the thickness, and so on and so forth. And I'm sure some of you who have undergone this procedure or who are planning to undergo or who've gone for an examination would be very familiar with these tests that are done. Now, the different kinds of procedures, what is most commonly known as LASIK, there have been millions and millions of LASIK performed around the world. Uh, it's a very long, uh, it's a very old procedure. I think it was in the 1980s, uh, late 1980s that uh, the first eczema laser came. And so it's got a very long track history. And uh, this is what is basically done. Uh, so if that was very fast, I'll just run through it again. This is a flap that's lifted up. And then you do an eczema laser ablation under the flap and uh, and basically uh, replace the flap back, back. And that reshapes your cornea. So once your cornea is reshaped, your eye is able to focus those light rays onto the retina correctly. Now, LASIK can be done in different ways. You could have a blade LASIK, which is basically when you cut your cornea, uh, when the doctor cuts your cornea using a blade, uh, also has a good track history uh, and does well generally. But the next iteration, of course, was to make it more predictable, more precise, more accurate in every form. And that, of course, is done with laser. So here, uh, this is basically the femtosecond laser-assisted LASIK or the blade pre LASIK. And here is uh, how this is done. Uh, 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 very gentle applanation cone is placed on your cornea and the laser is used a very very precise laser it's a femtosecond laser that's used to create this flap and then the eczema laser a different laser is used to ablate your cornea and that's how this is done so basically uh, you can see that this makes the whole predictability and the uh, the the precision of the surgery much better you have better outcomes and uh, and it makes your uh, vision uh, much better so now uh, there's also a different uh, uh, iteration which is also available, which is basically custom LASIK or Contura. Uh, and this is uh, slightly different in the sense that it actually studies more than 22,000 points over your over the cornea. So it's really doing a very detailed shape analysis of your cornea and customizing the treatment uh, to your cornea. So this becomes the next level of uh, customization where... Uh, where you can just quickly get a customized treatment done and therefore uh, get even better visual outcomes. Uh, the rest of the procedure, of course, is the same, except that the algorithm and the laser spots, the way they are applied is done in this customized way. Uh, you also have, I'm sorry, something that's known as uh, PRK, photorefractive keratectomy. Uh, and uh, this is basically done when you, uh, this is basically indicated for those patients who have a thin cornea or a very high power. I'm sure some of you uh, would have gone for uh, evaluation and you've been told that your cornea is thin or your power is very high. These are, uh, this and a few other procedures which I'll show are those that are suitable for such patients. Also, if you're playing, let's say, contact sports, for example, kickboxing or something like that, you can do this procedure because there's no flap, there's nothing mobile on your cornea. It's uh, directly, basically, the epithelium, the uppermost surface of your cornea. Yeah, the skin of your cornea, as I call it, is just removed. Now, this skin grows back uh, within, uh, you know, four to seven days. So that skin is removed. The laser ablation is done directly under, uh, you know, on the surface of the stroke cornea. And then the skin just grows back on its own. And in the interim, a bandaged contact lens is placed in your eye to keep you comfortable. Uh, there are different forms of this. Advanced surface ablation, it's known as, and you have all these different varieties. Uh, and as I said, it's uh, generally reserved for those patients where LASIK, femtolasic, and the next uh, kind of procedure that I'm going to show are not possible. So these are some of the indications, inadequate corneal thickness, dry eyes, occupation, anatomical abnormalities where you're not able to do others, and sometimes patient preference because of cost or whatever other reason and so on. Now, Smile uh, or small incision lenticule extraction is uh, another technology which is uh, the latest and it's come in 2011. So it also has a good track history by now with uh, more than I think two to three million procedures performed around the world. Uh, and uh, we've been doing this since 2015. Uh, uh, so uh, we've got a good experience with this. What is happening in this surgery is that you're creating this uh, this laser pattern within the cornea. So it's there are two cuts that are made within the cornea, as you can see here. And this is uh, all uh, done through a small incision. So that those two cuts uh, correspond to your refractive error, basically. There's a small keyhole entry that's made into your cornea then. So this can be even smaller than what's shown in this animation, actually. You can, you can bring it down to two millimeters. And then you pull out that little bit of tissue 
uh, from your eye, which is corresponding to your refractive error, and that reshapes the cornea. So there's nothing that's lifted up. There's no flap uh, or anything like that. So this uh, surgery has some advantages like uh, a stronger cornea, less dry eye, and uh, uh, and being able to perform it also in patients who were who were uh, they've got thin corneas or uh, or dip, uh, kind of some other abnormalities of the cornea. So I think that's also what uh, uh, Regina uh, underwent, and uh, she'll probably speak to you about it uh, a little bit more later. Now, the other surgery that you can do now, you would have gone sometimes and you would have been told that your power is really high to do laser. You know, you're not a suitable candidate candidate for laser. And in such patients, uh, we have other options. One of them is implantable collamer lens. This is also done in those patients, again, where the cornea is not suitable for surgery for some reason or the other. And here, uh, what is done is basically uh, there's a very, very, very uh, biocompatible lens, which is which means that it's very eye friendly and it's put into your eye sits above your natural crystalline lens and thereby it corrects your refractive error. So all these procedures, as you saw, the ones that reshape the cornea, this implantable collamer lens, all of these are actually bringing those light rays uh, onto sharp focus onto your retina and thereby giving you good vision. You also have another kind of uh, surgery that we do that is refractive lens surgery. This is for extremely high powers where you can actually uh, just remove the natural crystalline lens and put in an artificial lens, which corresponds to your refractive error and thereby correct uh, this. And you can use various kinds of lenses for this, multifocal lenses and so on and so forth. Very high-end lenses, which can give you good vision at all distances. Now, there'll be some patients who are still at the extremes, the real outliers where none of these individually are suitable. And that's where you do bioptics, where you do combinations. So you treat part of the refractive area on, at the lens, part of it on the cornea, and you can, you can correct even those difficult cases with that. Uh, there are just two more things which I'll just briefly discuss about. One is press biopia, which is basically the condition which many of us reach when we are 40 uh, and, and uh, we're wearing reading glasses, as I am doing. Uh, and that's basically uh, uh, the difficulty in reading that starts around the age of 40. You have different options for this, which is uh, one of which is press biopia classic. You have monovision. And you also have a technique called PEARL, which was, again, innovated at Dr. Agarwal's Eye Hospital, where you uh, make the small little... Uh, tissue uh, and put it in the center of the patient's uh, cornea through a laser dissected channel, very precise technique uh, with which you can again uh, regain the body's natural focusing abilities. And finally, uh, some of you again would have heard that you've got suspicious topographies, you've got early keratoconus uh, or you've got advanced keratoconus and therefore you're not able to focus well. Now this is what comes under the uh, first criteria that I mentioned, which is aberrations, which are abnormal corneas. And so your focusing ability is again bad. You're not able to see clearly. And for those patients, we have also got another technique, which was again innovated by us uh, and which has received wide international acclaim, which is called CARES, where you actually put in a, a bit of uh, stromal tissue, corneal tissue into laser dissected channels within your cornea. And thereby you can reshape this conical cornea. So what was conical initially, uh, as you can see in this profile, can be flattened down to uh, bring it to much better uh, focusing abilities. I think with that, I'll come to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Perfect. I mean, uh, fantastic. Thanks, Susan. That was brilliant. I'm sure we have a lot of questions coming your way. But before that, before we move to Susan, we're going to have Regina give us some insight as to... So I'm going to go very basic, uh, Regina. Honestly, I think that people want to know uh, what are the fears as a growing child? I, I already asked you the question. You were 13 when you started to get, uh, when you wore your first spectacle. What was it like? And tell, me, tell us a little bit about the fears that people go through as to, uh, you're going to wear this for life. How is it? What, what is that like? So um, wearing glasses was not something I always uh, personally never had anything against because I thought it just added some character to myself. But the thing I struggled with was um, I used to play a lot of sport and um, I, was, I'm a, I was a tomboy back in school, still am, but um, uh, I would in, invariably, you know, end up breaking my glasses or I would invariably end up losing them or, uh, you know, something or the other. And um, I would change at least six pairs of glasses in, in a year. You know, and um, <clears throat> and to add to that, so I decided I'd get lenses. And back then, lenses were still uh, I, daily lenses were still not a thing, and I couldn't really get to wear daily lenses. So I would wear like the lenses and have to wash them and clean them and keep them back. So when I wore them to school and I'd come back from school, 
the first, like I would I would go clean up and everything, but I would not even want to remove my lenses or I wouldn't have the box. So if I went out at sleep over at someone's place, I would forget to take my lens case and I'd be like, oh my God, what do I do? You know, and that led to actually me having an infection. I had a white spot in my eye and um, I had to get it fixed and all of that. This was back then. This was like about 15 years ago. So, um, so having done all that was really a big headache. So instead of even having lenses, I, I switched back to glasses because obviously for, uh, yeah. for other reasons, right? And um, I was fine with glasses, but then I also had this thing of the glasses making a mark on my nose and, and over here. And the field that I'm in, um, obviously, right, I need to like take care and all of that. And, um, and no one wants a mark on their nose, you know, like my mom has this little ridge on her nose and it's like a little black dot and I don't want that. Um, and it, it, for some people, it might be a shallow reason. For some people, it's, it's that's what they would like. And um, having taken all of that into consideration, I started using daily daily wear lenses, right. and I thought they were fine. They were they were good. They worked for me. But uh, also, what I felt like was, um, you know, if since there since I was hearing a lot of my friends and people around me doing a LASIK, I was like, because like you know i know that my my uh, my vision has stabilized and that i knew that that was one of the main things you needed for for you to work on your eye so i thought once it was stabilized i figured out what i could do and then i came to dr agarwal's and then and and i'm actually really glad um, till date, I tell everybody, it's not about the surgery, it's also the person who does it. And to have someone like Dr. Susan, just to make it look like it's nothing. Although I had like two days worth of tests, like I came twice to the hospital and I got like all the tests done. It took me a while. Um, the procedure is long and that might get a few people a little, um, it might unnerve a few people. But um, but honestly, that's the best because also once you you get everything checked you, i mean the main thing is to know if your cornea is thick enough or not right um and um and to know that it's good enough to actually do the lasik i think was to do smile was actually a um a relief you know like i knew because dr susan made it really easy for me she just explained it and we spoke and one thing one thing i was told because i'm a girl and because i use uh, makeup um she, I was asked to discard all of my old makeup that I was using previous to my surgery, which um, I didn't know that I had to do. You really don't know until and unless you're going to sit for surgery, right? Uh, or, you know, you know that you're going to at least. So I was asked to discard all of my eye makeup, everything that I used around my, my eye. Um, pre, uh, pre-surgery, I had to discard it post-surgery and get new things to use, which was also something I didn't know. And I'm, I'm glad I got to know. So... Um, yeah, so having done, and then having gone for the surgery, having gone sat there, it was literally 15 seconds each eye. Um, so before I knew it, it was done. Uh, there was no pain. I wasn't scared. Uh, that's that's who I, I am. But I know there will be people who are a little worried because you're in a room, you know, like like there's really like this big equipment. It's good. The equipment is huge, okay, but it's going to just like just it's going to come to your eye and that's about it. So, so I mean, it is a little intimidating, but also I think it's important that everyone finds the doctor that they are comfortable with. That would be my personal advice. Um, you know, when you go and you figure it out and if you find that maybe that your doctor is not understanding enough of your fear, if you have a fear, then you should probably also make sure that you're comfortable with that doctor or find someone else. I mean, it's a very personal thing and I would like to share this with other patients because it is important. Um, It it definitely adds to your courage to do it as well. Um, Yeah, so that's my two cents on the whole thing. Fantastic. I mean, uh, honestly, I had broken up the questions, but the way you put it all across together, it's just brilliant. Uh, Thanks, Regina. I have, a, I have a specific question to you. What was it like post the surgery? I mean, I think patients want to know after the surgery, how was the experience? What is your take? So I was given a, a pair of drops, um, two drops actually, and uh, and some medication. And I. so the thing is, you have to follow a schedule. It's very, very important. You'll understand it. So post-surgery, I had blurred vision. 
I couldn't focus too well for about a day or two, but not blurred as in not like it was hampering my life. But um, I, you wouldn't want to. In fact, you would want to rest your eyes. You know, you'd know there's a certain feeling you have around your eyeball. Um, you know that it's not it's not strained, but something has happened. And the more you rest it, the better it is for you. Um, you you don't really have to wear dark glasses as such, but you wouldn't want to strain your eye and look at the darkness. You would you wouldn't want to do it, so don't do it. Um, and I made sure that I relaxed. I didn't didn't stress myself out for the last, next two days, two three days. I made sure like you have to put you have to put like one drop alternate days, and you know there's this little schedule that you have to follow and follow it because it really does help. It uh, the eye drops suit the eyes and everything. So, so um, it wasn't difficult to deal with. Uh, it was like any post-surgery feeling, but this was not major at all. Even though it's a very important part of your body, your eyes are really, really important. Um, and also they're very sensitive, they're very delicate. Um, it's not that difficult. Like uh, it's really not that difficult and you can do it. And it, it felt good after that because, you know, after that my vision became like, close to 100%, which which is not everyone's vision even today, right? Like the older you grow, whatever it is, even if it's a small little um, difference, it is. But I'm really, I'm really glad I got a dude because now there's no squinting all the time. Or, you know, there's no, um, oh my God, where are my glasses? Oh my God, you know, my lenses. Oh shit, I have to order a new pair of lenses for the next month. You know, all these small, small things. Pardon me? They're, they're the small motivational factors which really annoy when you come, you know, when you compound that effect of actually wearing the contact lenses, wearing the glasses every day, not being able to play sports, like you said rightly, you know, and these are, however small and petty they may think or seem, these are 50% of, honestly, I mean, we've done surveys enough and more to understand 50% of people do it for personal reasons like this. I mean, it could be this, it could be that, but it's all a personal reason, 50% or more. Uh, very, very right, doctor. And also, one thing I want to talk about is a lot of my friends as well, like who who are very right. eligible for LASIK, but they have a fear um, that sometimes you just have to let them do it, like let them come up and say, okay, you know what, this is it, because <clears throat> um, uh, I did it because I wanted to make sure that I do not have to deal with these things on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, like really it was with, with my work and the amount I travel and in all of that, I don't want to spend half my life thinking about where are my glasses? Oh my God, I have to order my next pair of lenses. You know, these are small things that make my life easier. And that's what's very important for me because at the end of the day, you do everything to make your life easier, right? To live a better Absolutely. life. So, so I feel like, from a personal, from a personal pers like from my my uh, perspective, it definitely does make your life easier. And you should choose a doctor or a hospital that is going to make it easy for you, make the process easy for you, and not make you feel like um, you know you're doing something really big. In fact, they should make you feel like you're doing something that's that's done on an everyday basis. Because I see the fear in educated people. Uh, it's it, irrespective of whether educated or uneducated or age or no age, you know, we are, uh, older, younger, it's, um, it's, so it's not, it's not like really one thing. It's just that little stigma that people have that, oh my God, it's my eye. Oh my God. If, if something goes wrong, what's going to happen? All those doubts will be cleared if you actually figure out that the doctor and the hospital and everything is good for you. Fantastic. Thanks, Regina. Uh, Susan, I have a question for you, Susan. That's come up uh, pretty, uh, pretty quickly, actually, I must say. Uh, so somebody's asking, my marriage is fixed uh, in a month's time. Is it advisable to do LASIK or, or should I postpone it for later? Will I be able to do makeup and wear all that? Stuff? I mean, it's a pretty more specific question. So what's your take on that? And yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, we have this kind of patient to come in very frequently because uh, a lot of uh, uh, girls are especially brought by their parents just before their wedding. 
to get rid of those glasses because they don't want to be dependent on that for various reasons for the actual ceremony as such and even beyond they don't want to be dependent as regina rightly said there's so much of irritant factor in this whole thing this is by just just diverging from the question i'll also add another big irritant factor is when you sit in an ac environment and then you step out into the uh, you know the normal it just fogs up it just fogs up and you can't see and then you're forced to take it off and then clean it and then till the temperature difference is gone you're fogged so these things when you're taking a bath you have to remove your glasses these things are all such small uh, but significant irritant factors uh, so now coming back to this question yes uh, it is very much possible to do lasik even if you're getting married in a month uh, that's simply because the process is now uh, at such a level actually that it's become very safe it's become very uh, repeatable it's become very uh, predictable and it's also most importantly become very quickly healing so like regina said you might have a couple of days uh, where you feel that something is different with your eyes in the sense and as she also pointed out you you don't have a difficulty in doing any of your work you're able to do everything you're able to see but there's that something and that those 2 to 3 days are what is called as a healing period of the eye that's when there's a little bit of swelling in the eye and that swelling is just subsiding everything is just going back to its pre surgery state and uh, and that's that's basically it. you're still able to function but you can uh, you you may have a little sensitivity for 2 to 3 days that's it's also important why you should be putting your drops and then you can you can definitely go on with all your with your normal life in fact uh, we have many it professionals also who come in and then do it on a friday and go back to work on monday so uh, so yes one month is more than enough time i would say thank you uh, regina i must ask you something which is i think everybody's go to method for information today uh, before the surgery how many times did you google uh, slash uh, i mean google is the verb now so how many times do you search about Uh, about LASIK and what are the problems? And so, give me that part of it a little bit more in depth on that. Uh, so, Dr. Ashwin, the thing is, um, so I, I, I would just give you a little brief before I tell you what I did. So, I studied psychology, right. and um, the one constant uh, thing that I've always heard the psychologists, so even you know, even today, like my friends are all clinical psychologists and all of that. um they're working now so even today uh, this is constant complaint of you know the parent came in and they had already googled everything and they had said this but my child has this 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 and that 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 so that has been ingrained in my head and when i'm going to do something i would rather ask the doctor that i'm that i that you know is going to perform the surgery on me so that even they know that listen this person is asking um either the right questions or the wrong questions and like you rightly said in the beginning of this whole uh, webinar yeah. there are no wrong questions i mean we've all asked silly questions but you know it's 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 only because we have no idea about the whole thing that we are asking these questions and it is your right to ask questions yeah. you know yeah. but don't come with your own theories and hence form these questions it's it's important for you to ask questions because you need to know what's going on with your body as well at the end of the day so having said all of that i did not google it um i knew what was lasik about what lasik was about because everyone has been talking about it and i told you i knew that my my uh, vision had to stabilize i didn't know about my cornea thickness and you know all all of that and what what lasik am i going to do or, i didn't know any of those things and dr susan guided me through it um and so i think that's very important you don't have to really do it you know you don't have to go google you don't have to research you don't have to do any of these things because the more you do it um somewhere you're 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 creating that thing in your head where oh you know like the block yeah maybe you might read somewhere that so someone had someone had this experience and now yeah. that's going to be in your head throughout you know and right. sometimes what happens is people start owning that experience rather than exactly. that being their own experience exactly another also, thing i wanted to add i'm really sorry to this sure, sure. something that i experienced again so um because of my work i used to use a lot of glycerin in my eyes uh right. you know put here right. <clears throat> and all and i used to use a lot of eye drops like a lot uh right from uh you know uh uh everything to like sustain all of that like i went through like loads of eye drops to figure out which one worked for my eyes and i ended up getting a lot of dry eyes like i mean not lot not, not a lot but it ended up being like quite often and i didn't know what to do to it but that's something that the surgery has actually reduced 
it has reduced the dry eye this thing for me because okay. the it, in comparison to what it used to be before it's not at all anymore fantastic fantastic i'm happy to, to hear that actually Let me uh, just come in there, Ashwin, and just yeah, say, please, please, please. Uh, is that uh, I think uh, probably one of the reasons that the dry eye reduces also is that uh, contact lens over usage can also con contribute to uh, dry eye. So if you're been on contact lenses for long, you can have uh, a lot of issues creeping up slowly onto your eye just because of the daily, you know, eight hours of contact lens wear is not a small amount of time. So remember that that 24 hours in a day, eight hours you're wearing your contact lenses, approximately eight hours, eight hours you're sleeping, so your lids are closed. And then you have just eight hours left for your cornea to actually breathe freely, you know, oxygen. So in those eight hours, also if you overuse your contacts and extend them, which many people do to ten hours, eleven hours, you know, we see people coming in and saying, "Doctor, I wore it for eleven hours, twelve hours," and come back with a spot in their eye, an infection, which could uh, potentially turn dangerous. So these are the things that uh, the contact lens overusage can cause. And I think this is a beautiful uh, refractive surgery is actually a beautiful solution to get rid of that, not just the daily hassle of contact lenses, but also the problems that can be associated with contact lens overuse. Right. So we're getting a lot of questions actually from 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 a lot of places across the world. Uh, we're getting from Egypt, from Bangalore, from Bihar. Um, so it, it, it's a lot of questions. I was told my cornea is thin, uh, Dr. Susan, and I'm not eligible at that point for LASIK uh, due to previous evaluations. Is there any advanced available method? Yes. Uh, so this is again. Uh, a question that's often asked by many patients they come in for a re-evaluation hearing that something new has come up and they would have been told a few years back when they went for evaluation that their cornea is too thin now why corneal doctors are so particular about uh, the the condition of the cornea and that's the reason we do so many tests you know we keep doing it till we are fully satisfied that this is actually safe for your eye and one of the parameters that we study is the corneal thickness and if the corneal thickness is not sufficient there are certain procedures that cannot be done on your eye so uh, uh, now, luckily, in the near future, uh, I mean, in the near in the recent past, we've uh, developed some. Uh, we've got some new technologies that have come into the market. Uh, we had the older technology, which was PRK, which uh, I briefly mentioned, and then there's advanced surface ablations and the smile. These three techniques uh, are, have become very useful for patients with thin corneas. So smile uh, is just a lenticule that's extracted from an intact cornea, it's like keyhole surgery. So your biomechanics—that's what we—that's uh, the term that we use for the strength of the cornea. That is uh, relatively unaffected or less affected than LASIK, rather, I would put it as. PRK also has the same advantage since you're just baiting right on the surface of the eye without actually creating that flap. The flap is what can contribute to some weakness of the cornea. Again, that has an advantage. And patients who are really unsuitable, where we would say, look, we can't do corneal refractive surgery for you because your cornea is so bad. For those patients, we also have the option of phakic IOL or the ICL, the implantable collamer lens, which uh, just does not operate on the cornea at all. So you, instead of operating on the cornea, which is a weak point for you, we go and decide to correct the refractive error at a different level, that is at the lens. So that little contact lens that, uh, which is actually put into the eye, you know, it's not the contact lens that you wear on a daily basis, but a special contact lens. Uh, it's called a collamer lens which is inserted into your eye uh, gives you that ability to focus without operating on the cornea. We have a very nice question for you Dr. Susan. By birth, uh, this is from Bangalore, um, she's, in, she's in school, By from birth I have uh, color deficiency in both my eyes. Am I eligible for laser, uh, LASIK? If yes, color deficiency, <laughs> will color deficiency also go away? I mean I know the answer but I'll let you answer this. Okay. Uh, so the first part of the question is uh, whether you are eligible. Uh, yes, you are eligible. Uh, being color deficient does not preclude you from undergoing LASIK surgery because the pathology for that causes color deficiency is something completely different. It's not to do with your cornea or with the focusing ability of your eye. So yes, you can definitely undergo LASIK. But does it correct your color deficiency? No, it doesn't. Uh, you would still have the same color blindness which you had before surgery. But you would be able to see things sharper. So possibly your <laughs> the ability to see better without glasses might give you better vision during your day, but you will still retain those problems that you had in terms of color vision problems. Okay. What is the minimum age for LASIK? Okay, that's again a very, very interesting question. Uh, the minimum age is when your refraction stabilizes. So uh, 18, you would consider it as the least uh, thing, but 21 maybe. Sharper. So possibly your <laughs> the ability to see better. I'm sorry, there was there was a little bit of echo there. Uh, so 21 would be a better age, but uh, sometimes you have uh, patients coming in who have uh, to do it for a particular reason, 
and for them we check their stability so we have stable refraction for the last uh, you know one or two or three years which are absolutely stable and if your conal biomechanics uh, on testing are showing to be normal your all your conal testing are not as normal we could still do it at 18 years and the interesting thing ashwin is also that we sometimes do it for children that's younger than 18 we could do it as for as young as 5 6 9 years old and the reason we do this is not for cosmetic purposes right. but for a, it's for a very medical a very important reason that's for those children who have high powers in the eye very high powers now we're talking about abnormally high powers and for those children these high powers can actually become a hindrance for their ability to see clearly even with glasses which means that even when they wear glasses they are not seeing clearly so what and is the cut off for that what is the power cut off if you can give everybody a note on what is the power multiple factors you could have bilateral high high amyotropia which means that the power is high very high let in both eyes let me rephrase the question what is the power at which you expect patient or people to walk in and say check me i mean that's that's the cut off that we're looking for we okay. want for you so the cut off would be let's say 6 to 7 diopters maybe 5 6 7 diopters it would be in that range but but here's what is important it's sometimes only in one eye and one eye is uh, completely normal the child sees very well the other eye has the power the parents are sometimes not even aware of this because nobody is testing the eye individually the person is seeing with both eyes together the child has been seeing clearly just because his one eye was functioning well the other eye goes into what is known as lazy eye and starts to lose his vision even on correction with glasses and those are the patients sometimes sometimes we have small children who are very resistant to wearing glasses these very high powers sometimes you need to give them contact lenses and not glasses because otherwise there's going to be an imbalance between the two eyes you cannot have a zero power on one eye and wear a minus 7 glass on the other eye because that's going to cause imbalance double vision and all these things so you have to give them contact lenses and in children contact lenses are a double edged sword because you can sometimes get infections it's more difficult to care for for the children to take care of them and and they just sometimes resist it they don't want that thing in their eye for such children refractive surgery and also for squints if they have squints some squints these children we do refractive surgery even in childhood but again that's not for a cosmetic purpose that's for a medical reason fantastic okay we have uh, i i i believe uh, regina has to uh, has to leave in some time Uh, and we we'll let her go. We will keep the questions still going because we still have a lot of questions to be answered. But Regina, you have been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much to give your personal input and experience. More importantly, when you educate people about uh, about this procedure, not just the procedure, the whole experience of it before, the in, and after. I think it brings to people a relatability to it from a people perspective rather than a doctor's perspective. And Regina, before, before you leave, Ashwin, before you leave, I just like to thank Regina personally for coming on the show uh, because you know it, it was uh, so pleasant. I sent her a message uh, asking her, Regina, would you be able to uh, just come and share your experience on Smile? And seriously, she's such a down-to-earth person and such a nice person. She said immediately, you know, I'll be happy to <laughs> share my experience, of course. Uh, and it's it's been a pleasure to be your doctor, Regina. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doctor Susan. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm so sorry. just before i go i want to say um someone had asked right sunita from bangalore i think had asked about her wedding and all of yes. that one month and it, i doctor also said it can be done to that i'd like to add please just make sure uh, sunita if you're still watching just make sure your your makeup all the makeup products that your makeup artist use especially around your eye um maybe don't take her products maybe get your own ask her what you'd need for your own eye get new products because i mean at the end of the day you want to be more careful about uh, all of this right uh, and that's what i did as well i made sure that when doctor told yeah. me that i need to clear out all of that and uh, get in new makeup i made sure i got it because you don't want to mess with your eye at the end of the day perfect advice yeah. absolutely okay and i thought i should just say that and thank you so much uh, dr susan um you have been an amazing doctor in fact i have told a lot of people that's and that's why I, till today i stress on the fact that you should have a someone who can guide you through it very pleasantly and very nicely and um thank you dr ashwin for having me over as well um, like i said we've uh, we've gone a long way i've gone a long way with dr agarwal's and hope to continue like this and uh, i will see all of you all soon thank you so much for having me over and good 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 luck to all the new stuff that you've been doing i know that there are a lot of there's a film coming up i know yes. and If you want to talk about that, you can. 
Uh, actually, oh, no, that's fine, Doctor. I'm really glad with what we spoke about today. I'm very happy with this whole uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Bye. Bye, Doctor. Bye, everybody. It was nice talking to all of you. Thank you, Vijay. So, keeping up to the questions, guys, uh, we want to move on with the questions. Uh, this is a question from a uh, person from Abu Dhabi. Uh, I'm a driver by profession. Is it true that post LASIK glare and halos uh, will occur and if so, what is the advice for him? Uh, is the request? So, uh, glare and halos post LASIK uh, were a major complaint in the past. And that was also partly because of some of the laser, the older technology that was being used. The laser platforms that were being used in the past were uh, not actually giving you aspheric kind of treatment. They were giving different uh, shapes to the cornea. They were correcting the power, but the shape was a little different. So, uh, so even though you could see well, you would sometimes have glare and halos. Uh, that has been rectified to a large extent with the newer technology, which gives you aspheric uh, contour to the cornea at the end of surgery. So that's an important advancement. That having been said, laser uh, glare and halos can still sometimes occur in some patients. Uh, and that especially happens with nighttime driving. And for this, uh, this could be because of a very minimal uh, uncorrected refractive error sometimes. Sometimes it could be just because of dry eyes. In the initial one or two days, like Regina also said, you could have uh, you know some visual disturbance and that, that's because of the healing uh, time that the cornea takes. So there are various causes uh, for this glare and halo. So if you're experiencing that post plastic surgery, I would advise you to just uh, visit your doctor and find out why it is happening particularly in your case and also a uh, couple of things that you can do if you're having this a uh, quick quick uh, uh, yeah. you know this thing is just put on the uh, so, you know you may need to wear a thin power glass just at that point of time when you're driving and second thing is you could also put on that light that's on the inside of your car and that generally helps to a large extent you know the the light that's in inside the car if you put it on and then drive at night it's likely to give you a lot of effect but first go and check up why you in your particular case are having this issue that's a great two second hack right there that's a two-second hack, which is very, very nice. Uh, uh, somebody wanted to know, post-LASIK, how long does he or she follow up in the hospital? This is from somebody from Britain. Uh, Okay, uh, so um, post LASIK, uh, you need to uh, have the the actual actually the procedure, the post operative uh, follow ups are quite uh, not very hectic at all. We see you on the first day. Uh, we generally then see you on the seventh day, and then the one month, and that kind of finishes off uh, your immediate post operative uh, reviews. We then would like to maybe see you at six months and then one year. These are for routine reviews, uh, just, just to make sure everything is fine. Uh, so there are some people who miss this, but we would like to at least see continue seeing you once a year. And that's that's what we always advise for every patient. Every person, in fact, is advised to have a yearly uh, eye checkup. And you come back to that. Now, one thing at this point also I'd like to say, Ashwin, is that uh, we have treated you on your cornea, which is just purely to remove the power. This is for various reasons, as mentioned to you. But remember, if you're a high myo, which means you had high minus power, your retinal problem is still continue to exist. You know, right. so you're you're a person who had a high myopia. Your eye may be probably longer than the usual eye, so your retina is generally a little bit more stretched out. Now, because your retina is stretched out, this retina of yours is prone to develop weak spots over time. And even right. if your first retinal examination may be a year or two years or three years has been fine, it could happen that you develop these weak spots five or six years down the line. So yearly annual uh, examinations, especially of the retina, and also, of course, your corneal health is, is a must for every patient who's uh, undergone uh, refractive surgery. Right. Uh, what is the success rate? I mean, what is the success rate of this procedure and how many uh, percentage has, do you do in terms of what is your, what is your success rate? <laughs> that's that's a good question. I think the success rate is extremely high. You know, they've been, um, um, I, I really don't have the number offhand with me, but there are, there, there are about 30, 40 million cases done all over the world, I guess, uh, with uh, with uh, LASIK and uh, SMILE has got about 3 million. SMILE was started in 2011. All of these have uh, long follow-ups. The success rate is really high in terms of what we uh, scientists measure as efficacy, safety. All these things have been studied in extreme detail because, you know, we have journals uh, which are dedicated to this. We have uh, numerous articles that come out every month on, on these specific topics, you know, real minute studies of these, uh, this thing, uh, these different techniques. Uh, 
and the safety and the efficacy have been found to be extremely high Cons uh, also taking in consideration that you've done all your pre-operative checkups and that you're a suitable candidate my personal success i'm happy to say is uh, on par with uh, the best in any of the centers around the world we have uh, i'm lucky to be working at dr agarwal's eye hospital which is uh, one of the best centers as far as technology is concerned and then of course uh, I have been doing the surgery for many, many years now. And so I have a reasonable amount of experience, I'm happy to say, with this. So uh, we are having very good results with this. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, my uh, Somebody from Bangalore uh, is asking, from childhood, one eye was normal, my other eye was, there was power. If LASIK is done, can I get full vision in both eyes? Yeah, yeah. So this this is something similar to what we just discussed, where uh, one eye is normal and the other eye has power. So what is happening in this child is that uh, this child has basically developed a lazy eye. So the eye that's been seen clearly has always been stimulating the brain, whereas the eye that's not been seen clearly has not stimulated its respective part of the brain. And because of that, that part of the brain is not really well, as well developed as the other eye and it's led to something that we call as amblyopia or in layman's term, lazy eye. Now this lazy eye, if untreated within time, can become a permanent loss of vision. And that's the reason in children, it's very important to get your checkups done. You know, just because your child is seeing clearly, don't assume that his or her eyes are normal because you need to check each individual eye. You know, the child may happily be walking around with when we've seen umpteen patients who come in completely blind in one eye and they haven't realized till they suddenly accidentally, you know, something came in their field of vision or they blocked their eye and they found out they were not seeing well with the other eye at all. Yeah. So this is important. Uh, please come for your checkups. And for this particular child, I think uh, if the refractive error or the glass power is what is contributing to the decreased vision and the child is, uh, there is an imbalance in terms of not being able to wear glasses, then uh, refractive surgery could definitely help in achieving, in bringing both eyes into balance and then follow it up with something that we call as patching, which means we patch the other eye and exercise this eye so that this part of the brain is again stimulated. So you're yeah. trying to stimulate and get that part of the brain to work again. You're giving exercises to this eye, the, the uh, operated eye, uh, by patching the other eye and selectively making this eye see. And that is a way that you can get this uh, eye to start seeing again. But remember, there's a time limit by which you need to do this. So unless you do it within that time limit, that vision can be permanently lost. You must come into the center fast. I mean, you must go to the hospital and meet your doctor fast. Right. That's the main key aspect of it. So that they can analyze and understand which stage they are in and get treated immediately. Uh, one good question that comes up. Um, this is from Mumbai. Actually, can I directly opt for smile instead of LASIK? I want, when I went to the last center, uh, they didn't have that treatment. So what is the latest, the latest treatment? Yeah, that okay. I uh, see, uh, uh, basically, uh, SMILE is a technology which can be done for myopia, which means if you have minus power, and astigmatism, which means if you have cylinder. Uh, if you have a plus power, hyperopia, uh, SMILE is still not commercially available, though it's uh, it's uh, the software has come out and it's being tried out in some centers, some centers, uh, very few select centers where it's being tried out, but uh, as yet it's not commercially available. So other than that, but then my hyperopic uh, refractive surgery forms a very small percentage of the population that you're treating actually when we treat. The large majority of patients have minus power, which is myopia and cylindrical power. And these are amenable very easily with SMILE. So SMILE is generally suitable for all patients who are suitable for LASIK or, uh, uh, but the reverse may not always be true. So, so if you're not suitable for LASIK, you may still be suitable for SMILE. Uh, but if you are, uh, I mean, if you're suitable for LASIK, you may still be suitable for SMILE. But every patient who's suitable for SMILE may not be suitable for LASIK, which means if you have a thin cornea or, uh, or a weak cornea or you have severe dry eyes or you have some other issues with your cornea, you may not be a candidate for LASIK, but you may still be a candidate for SMILE. But most patients are by default candidates for SMILE. Yeah, understood. How long do the uh, effects of this uh, procedure last of laser on spectacle removal? How long do they last? And I'll add another question to that is what is the impact of this two cat practices? Two different people are asking, but I think it's a club question better. Uh, will I get cat track later on and how does that treat? Will I, will, is it okay? Yeah. So the effect uh, is going to last. So what, what does refractive surgery do? Essentially, you have to understand that first. It's basically bringing you back to what a normal person who has never worn glasses is like. So uh, somebody who's never worn glasses uh, is what you're going to become like. And people who have not worn glasses need to start wearing glasses when they're around the age of 40. It might be plus or minus a couple of years, one year or so generally. 
So when you become around 40, you may need to start wearing reading glasses again if you've undergone refractive surgery in your childhood, in your younger days rather, not childhood. And that's also one of the reasons why patients are more motivated to the earlier they get it done, the better it is because they have a benefit of completely glass-free lifestyle for a much longer period. By the time you're 40, your distance vision will still be very clear, but you may need to start pulling out those glasses for just vision alone. And there are treatments like, you know, you can do a touch on or an, um, you know, touch up surgery and things like that. At that age, if you if you still don't want to wear glasses, you have treatment options at that age also. So that's about wearing glasses. About cataracts developing. Sorry, Ashwin. No, no, go ahead. About cataracts developing, cataracts are uh, unrelated to your refractive surgery completely. So if you're going to develop cataract at a certain age, you're going to develop it anyway. So for some people, it might develop at the age of 50. Some people, it might develop at the age of 60. Some people, 70 and so on and so forth. And that, that is going to happen as it normally would do during your aging process. Right. And uh, refractive surgery uh, in the past used to be an issue with regards to, uh, you know, how you calculate the IOL power and all. But now we have reached a stage where all this has become extremely accurate. So the ability to even calculate lens powers post-refractive surgeries, which is again a topic of a lot of research, and it's reached a level where we are able to get very good accuracy with that as well. Fantastic. Uh, we have a very specific question from an optometrist, Gopinath. Uh, wishes to know more about the long-term visual outcome uh, from the other world's experience and uh, maybe say a specific data of a 10 year follow-up on LASIK or PRK or SMILE or whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, well, that's, that's actually a difficult question because I haven't, uh, but uh, we, uh, uh, are doing since uh, 2015, we are doing SMILE, we have been doing LASIK since, uh, I think, Ashwin, you might remember, maybe 1997 or so? 97, 98, yeah. 97, 98, we brought in LASIK. We were among one of the first centers in India to bring this uh, to our hospital. Uh, so uh, we've got a lot of experience with that. We do a huge number of patients every month. And now I'm just talking about the main center at Chennai, but uh, we also have other centers around uh, the world where also we've got uh, smile machines installed and we've got classic machines uh, installed. And so uh, I think the overall data is going to be humongous because just because of the reason that we've got 95 centers around the world. So that's going to be a tremendous amount of data. Right. And, and I'm, I'm happy to say that all the data with regards to uh, SMILE and LASIK as such has always been positive because we do have a clinical board which reviews cases, you know, and I've never uh, seen a, you know, uh, a patient uh, yeah. which has become completely messed up or something like that. Th those kind of issues are actually very rare provided you do your screening properly and things like that. Exactly. I mean, I would add that uh, if you screen well and you're eligible for the laser, I mean, we'll keep a simple number. Uh, out of 10, seven people will be eligible for laser. This was the history when it came to LASIK. Uh, when it comes to SMILE, you can add eight or nine people who are eligible for the laser. And uh, the one will obviously be cut off because of non-eligibility of other reasons. Uh, but yeah, definitely the eligibility once you're through, that's why the number of days or the number of investigations that it takes is a little bit long, but it's worth every uh, sentiment over there. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of more questions coming in, but I'm sure we have already four minutes beyond time. So we're going to uh, cut short today's uh, episode of breaking the myths with uh, removal of glass power using laser. But we're going to have our next session on October the 10th. On October the 10th, we're going to be uh, understanding intraocular lenses a little bit more. And I know that cataract is a huge element of it. And can we break this down for you guys to make you understand what intraocular lenses are and how does it work? Uh, we're, we're very excited for this Ed Vision series where we're educating on vision. We wanted to thank Dr. Susan. I know Regina is not here, but thank her for the inaugural uh, episode of this uh, Ed Vision wanted to also take this opportunity to thank all of you guys to actually attend and put in all these questions that you have uh, put forth uh, from, from wherever you are across the world. So thank you so much for every little bit of the question. Uh, we definitely are going to look at these questions and have them answered on that uh, Facebook slash YouTube itself. Uh, so happy to uh, see you guys on October the 10th. Again, uh, the timings will come close to our, uh, when we Go close to the date but watch out follow us on facebook youtube and instagram so it's easy to keep in date and keep in touch inform educate your families about eye health because it's going to be important in this post-covid era now thank you very much
Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ashwin. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye. Thank you.